excited for this morning. As we chatted a little bit about last week, uh, we're so excited to have Joel and Julianne Percy here with us. And um, actually, let, let's just bring the, you want you guys come up. Let's give a, a rousing welcome to Joel and Julianne as they come on down. And uh, many of you will know uh, the Percy family, and then some of you, this will be the first time getting to hear about them. Uh, I first met these guys at a church I used to work at called The Meeting House. Some of you know I used to work at that church, uh, just kind of a different part of the city here in Oakville. Joel, Joel was already on staff there, so we had a little bit of time, uh, excuse me, overlapping on the staff team together. And these guys were leading in all kinds of different ways at the church. And, um, and then we'll get to hear a little bit about their story, but they've been overseas for a while. And so they're back for a couple months, and um, we're so excited to have them. I think the last time they joined us, Joel and I were chatting, was... Uh, December-ish or Christmas-ish of 2016, when we're still at the Performing Arts Center. So Joel was almost on autopilot, could have ended up going there this morning, but we're glad you landed here. And uh, so we're so excited just to hear about what God's been teaching them and what it means uh, for them as they've been leading and serving in a different context. And so just we want to hand it over to them. There will be a time where you guys can ask any questions you have too. And then towards the end, we'll have a time just to pray for them and their family and then go into communion time. But guys, thank you so much for being here and giving us some of your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. We're sitting. It's casual. All right. Good morning. Uh, we're excited to be with you guys today. And uh, yeah, as Matt said, I, if he hadn't really called it out in the email, I would have been at the Performing Arts Center this morning. So I'm glad that... We're here in the same room as you. Um, so as Matt said, we have been living overseas. We're in our fourth year living in Zambia now. And I think just to give you a sense of what to expect this morning, our plan is not really to preach, just kind of share and talk and do a little back and forth, tell you a little bit about our life there and our work, um, and a, maybe a little bit of context on um, Zambia and what ministry there looks like got a video to show you at the end and so hopefully uh, you'll come away learning some new things maybe interested in in chatting with us after and learning more so um, to I'll let Julianne start it off with just a little bit of intro about our school and what we are doing over there in Zambia all right so like Joel said we uh, live in Macha Zambia so if you don't know where that is Zambia is kind of two countries up from South Africa so we're still in the southern part of Africa um, and matcha is basically out in the bush. So um, we live about three hours from Victoria Falls, which is awesome. And um, we're about maybe just over an hour from the nearest town. So we get our groceries about an hour away. Um, so we're definitely out in the bush. Um, and we work at Matcha International Christian School. So MIX for short, if you hear us say MIX. Um, and the aim of MIX is to provide a qu quality Christian education um, for kids in the community. So it is a private school, but um, our costs are a lot lower than a regular private school, um, and we're trying to up the level of education in that community. Um, MIX has about 200 kids at it, um, and all of them are Zambian except for about seven of them, which two, two are ours, and a few Americans and a couple Dutch kids. Um, the rest are all from Zambia, mostly from the local community. Um, we have about 50 kids who are boarders. Um, so they are there um, during the week. A lot of them come from, they still live in the community because of their situations. Um, they're often um, orphaned or in a vulnerable situation. So we bring them into boarding so that they have um, basically food to eat and a safe place to stay. And then on the weekends, they go back um, to their families just so they're still connected. So often they are um, living with their aunts and uncles and kind of, um, how do you describe it? They're kind of lowest on the, on the chain <laughs> and they don't get treated quite as well as um, the kids of that family. So um, we bring them into boarding and they have a, a safe place to stay. And then we have about 12 kids who are there full-time boarding. So they're from either the big city or um, farther away and they're here um, at the school full-time. So there's lots of kids always around, which is great for our kids. Um, we live on our school campus, so literally just walk out the door and there's a bunch of people to play with. Um, even our two-year-old just walks out the door and we don't really worry about him. <laughs> it's like uh, Nathaniel. I don't know. <laughs> around. Um, the biggest hazard is our garbage pit, but he knows not to go near that. So uh, we do have a fence, which is great, and he obviously stands out, so we know if there's a little two-year-old walking down the road, Everyone knows where he goes back to. <laughs> um, 
So um, our school is made up of all Zambian teachers. Um, we do have some international volunteers, including ourself, um, but the rest of our staff are all Zambian, which is awesome. Um, the school was started in 2005, so a couple years ago we had our 10th anniversary. And it started with one grade one class, um, and then every year they added a different grade until we got up to grade seven. So we actually start now at pre-reception, which is, I guess, kind of like the equivalent of JK. Um, um, basically, three-year-olds can start in our school um, up to grade seven. And we have a different variety of ages of kids, so just because you're in grade seven doesn't mean you're like 12 years old. Last year, we had some 16-year-olds who were graduating from grade seven. Um, just because they started their education later. Um, so it's not really by age um, like it is here. Whenever someone comes to our school, part of my job is to test them and see where they're at academically, and then I put them in a grade that's appropriate um, to their level. So um, we have all different ages at our school, which is fun. Um, side note, our son Caleb played on our school soccer team last year, so we <laughs> he um, was playing with, he was six at the time, Six or seven playing with kids who are all like 16 year olds on the same team. So <laughs> that was pretty fun. Fun it was experience. Basically, <laughs> all an elaborate plan to get him on the rep team when we moved back to <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Our kids are good at soccer. Let's give them that. Um, uh, we came in 2015, um, in January, <clears throat> and the school at the time was being run by um, Gil and Rhonda Krause, who were asked, to, they started the school, and they were asked to come by community members because this, the area needed better quality education. Um, it's a thriving community, so Matcha is a very Brethren in Christ area. There's a mission hospital there, um, and also a nursing school, and then um, Malaria Research Institute. So um, people from all over the world actually come to Matcha to research malaria, and they've actually done an awesome job of basically almost eradicating it in that area. Um, so they're moving on to other things, but um, yeah, a lot of research goes on there. We have a big tent that's full of mosquitoes and... They have what's really the best problem to have if you research malaria, which is they did such a good job getting rid of it that there are no longer malaria cases in the area, yeah. so they're no longer able to get funding to study malaria. So that's awesome. How can you study malaria? There, there is none, and so that has been the impetus to start studying other diseases in the area. So, I mean, that's a major, major success for mm -hmm. them. Yeah. yeah, it's a very fun community to be in. Um, so like I said, we came in January 2015, and my job at the time was to start an ESL program, so that's my specialist in teaching. And basically every child there is English as their second language, except for a few. Um, but my main goal is to help struggling readers, so really to get them their English up to speed and working on their reading. So I started a program for that, um, where kids come out of their class, kind of like they do here, and get that extra support. Um, Joel will talk about a little bit what he did, but at the time he was kind of doing strategic planning for the school and getting some systems back into place that were needed at the time. Um, and then October of 2016, the Krauses decided to retire and they asked us to take over their positions. So Joel is now the director of the school and I'm the director of education. So kind of all things education related. <laughs> um, there are many other things he does, but. <laughs> and we divide it up well. So it's a school, you do everything related to education and I'll do the other stuff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs> um, some of the things that I do, I focus on our chapel curriculum. So every morning, um, our school starts at 7.30 and we have chapel um, every day. So um, we actually use the KidMax curriculum from the meeting house and show the video on Mondays. And then we expand on the big idea um, throughout the week, which has been awesome. Um, I help with various administrative things like report cards um, and improving strategies. But my main focus is on mentoring the teachers. So. Um, just helping them improve their strategies. I spend a lot of time just sitting in classes and observing and seeing what's happening and then based on what I see I can um, help people and yeah, I just, I teach the teachers. Um, I do in-services for them based on what I see the needs are and it's a lot of fun. I think I'm gonna pass it to you. All right, is this on? Can you guys hear me? I'll just be loud, is that okay? Yeah, all right. Um, so as Julianne said, I ended up being 
director of the school after the previous uh, directors left. If you were to survey Joel a number of years ago about lifelong dreams, running a primary school wasn't actually on the list. Um, but it's been a fantastic experience. So I basically do kind of the administrative and business side of things. Uh, finances, HR, staff evaluations, running staff meetings, uh, interacting with our board of directors, the Ministry of Education, just kind of all the behind the scenes stuff that isn't directly related to teaching. I do actually teach a little bit too. A couple days a week I'm in with our grade sevens teaching math, which is fun, I enjoy that a lot. Uh, but for the most part, I'm in the office. And I think um, to kind of sum up our work and my focus especially over the last couple of years is since we started as directors our job really has been to prepare for our departure um, one of the things i did when i started in the role was go around to a bunch of community leaders in matcha and just talk to them about the school where they thought it should go what was working what wasn't all of that and one of the guys that i talked to uh, who was actually one of the heads at the hospital but who had kids who had gone to mix said something that really just jumped out to me and kind of I think gave the fuel for the work we've been doing. He said, I love mix, the results are fantastic, but I worry that a white person is going to have a bad day and my kids aren't going to have a school anymore. And what he was recognizing was that the school has been led at least, not the whole staff, but the leadership has always been people from overseas. And there's just a risk there in terms of sustainability. And so we have been, and, and I think leadership isn't the only issue. There, was a, there were a bunch of problems we kind of uncovered um, when we arrived that the school was teaching the kids well, but there was almost nothing in terms of infrastructure. Uh, and I don't use that in a lofty sense. It's like, how much money do we spend in a year? Uh, I don't know, right? How, do we collect all the fees from the parents? I don't know, there's a basket by the door. You know, like, so it really, there was almost nothing in terms of what you would expect of systems and processes and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, you know, rather than teaching three-year-olds, here's something I can like get into and maybe help with. So I'd say the last couple of years have been really focused on how do we get the school on a solid footing so that it's going to be there for decades. Uh, and that it's not always going to be reliant on either funding necessarily or personnel coming from overseas. So we've done a few things that we're really happy with. One of the first things we did was start a Zambian board of directors. So we now have uh, a board made up of local community leaders who have been amazing and are really taking ownership of the school. And I lean on them all the time because, you know, even four years in, where there's all kinds of cultural barriers to navigate and stuff like that. Uh, and they help me out a lot. Uh, we've started a PTA, so we've got parents involved now in giving feedback and leadership of the school. Uh, we've started just stuff that I would consider basic, but is a little bit new to people there, like uh, paying attention to how well our teachers are teaching. So a couple times a year, we sit down with them, talk about their performance, go in the classroom and observe them, give them some tips and mentoring and that kind of stuff. Uh, we've started an employee of the month thing, which I always find amazing because to be honest here, I think what we did, if I was working somewhere and they had the kind of program we have, it would probably be met with a lot of eye rolling and like, yeah, yeah, you're giving someone a certificate for employee of the month. Um, there, it is like a huge deal. We will have people like tears streaming down their face when they win employee of the month. And all the staff coming around and hugging them like they just won the Super Bowl, like it's amazing. So. Uh, a lot of our learning has just been what is going to be important to our staff here, which isn't always what would maybe translate in Canada. So that's the kind of stuff I do. Um, I think one of the things I'll mention that's good for context about the Zambian education system is that in grade seven, everybody, every student in Zambia writes a national exam, the same exam. And that grade seven exam basically determines the future of your education. If you do really well, you can go to a boarding school where you're gonna get a really good 
education. Uh, if you do okay, you might qualify for a day school where it's gonna be a bit iffy, and if you do bad enough, you're just not going to school anymore. You're done, grade seven was it for you, and you can go with your parents and sell stuff in the market or work in the field or whatever, but it's over. Uh, and so, obviously, that's a ton of pressure on one exam. Now, the way the languages work in Zambia, there's about 40 different tribal languages all over Zambia. And for the first few years of school, they're taught in their local language. And around uh, a, a few years later, around grade three, they start learning more in English. Now, English is the national language for business and government and all of that, because of course, when you have these 40 different languages, they can't communicate with each other. You need a common language, so it's English. So that grade seven exam is written in English. And so what that means is you have kids who English is their second language. They've, in a lot of cases, only started learning it four years ago, and even then, what we hear is that in the government schools, especially as you get more in the remote areas, they really actually don't teach in English. Uh, you've got, say, a group of kids who all speak Tonga, and a teacher who speaks Tonga, and all of them, including the teacher, their English is a bit questionable, and no one's watching. What language are they all gonna speak? They're all gonna speak Tonga. And so you have kids who go to school literally almost never speaking English, and then they're put in this room at the end of grade seven and told, write an exam in English and your whole future is riding on it. And they just really never stand a chance. And so one of the things I think that is one of the biggest strengths of MIX is that we teach in English from the beginning. We also have curriculum in the local language, so they are getting that. But right from three years old, they're learning English. And if you talk to the people in the community around Matcha, that is what they will say. Uh, to us is we can tell when a kid is from mix just by the level of their English. Just by listening to someone, I can say that kid goes to mix. Uh, and so our kids have uh, historically done really well on that exam. In fact, 100% pass rate. Uh, I keep telling people that just because we've had 100 so far, it doesn't mean we're always going to have it. And you know, this might be the year that we don't. But the results have been have been outstanding, and I think that ha is what has helped. Uh, us get a reputation in the community where people want to send their, want to send their kids to us. Uh, and so I think when I look at the place of mix in the community, uh, it's, really a big, it's really a big deal. A couple things that it helps to do. One is uh, it helps attract professionals. So uh, people who maybe would work at the malaria research or at the hospital or the nursing school or the other schools are more likely to move to matcha because they know there's a quality school for their kids. Uh, and so that is a big, um, a big thing. Uh, it's giving these kids from matcha a chance to go on to uh, better quality education in secondary, which then opens the door for post-secondary and, and hopefully go on and, and get some professional qualifications, which really just would have been out of reach for a lot of them. Um, and I don't know if Julianne mentioned, but about a third of our kids are kids who could not afford to pay our fees. Our fees are not high, but they're out of reach even for some families in Matcha. So about a third are sponsored uh, through an organization in the US. Um, and also the school has a policy, uh, what we call our tithe policy, for every 10 paying kids, we go out in the community and find a kid who couldn't afford to come and invite them to come for free. So it ends up being altogether about a third of our kids are kids who couldn't afford to be there, which is, uh, which is fantastic to see these kids come in uh, to the environment and just flourish and do well. So that's a little bit about our work, the school, um, Matt had suggested, and so what we're going to do next is it might be helpful for you guys to hear a little bit about just our story of how we ended up getting there. Um, because one of the things that we find um, that has surprised me, actually, is the number of people who will come up to us, not in Zambia, usually, but in Canada, and say, I've always wanted to do something like what you're doing. Uh, and, and that maybe doesn't totally surprise me in a church context. It blew me away in my previous work life. So I used to work in marketing at Loblaw. Uh, and when I left there, 
I wasn't sure what the reaction was going to be to Joel is like putting his career on hold and moving to Zambia to work at a school. I thought people would just kind of think I was odd and move on with their day. Uh, in fact, almost like quietly on the side, I had so many people come up to me and say, man, I wish I could do what you're doing. Uh, to which I often thought or said, you know you can, right? Like that, that is a possibility. Um, but I think it's something that a lot of people maybe have simmering in the background um, for whatever reason. And so, well, you know, maybe it's helpful, maybe it's not, but we're just gonna share a little bit about how we ended up doing what we're doing, and then maybe some stuff in there you can take away. So, over to you. All right, I think I start the story. <laughs> um, so, for me, it was always kind of like the cliche, but I always knew I was gonna go to Africa someday. I feel like God planted that desire in my heart at a young age and was just always fascinated by that side of the world. I was the kid who was like glued to the World Vision commercials back in the day. <laughs> so I would watch them like religiously um, and just was fascinated by kids living in huts and that whole situation. Um, and just kind of knew that that was possibly gonna be part of my future, I guess, um, or I wanted it to be. Possibly. Wait. Yeah, that's the wrong word. <laughs> well, back in the day, just to be clear, if you wanted to date Julianne, it was like, just so you know, my husband is going to Africa with me. If you're not willing to go to Africa, you know, keep looking. So that was pretty much on yes. the He didn't use those words, but it was clear, right? We knew. Yeah. <laughs> That is true. Um. <laughs> Which ladies, it's a smart time to get it on the table, by the way. I was like, yeah, sure, I moved to Africa, no problem, I'm good. A, f a few of them said yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's true, it's true. I'll say anything at the time, right? Um, so in my third year of university, I went out school, to school at West, and I just felt like God was saying, okay, this is the time, which was kind of odd in the middle of my degree. Um, so I took my third year off of university and ended up going, um, ironically, to a boarding school in Zambia. Um, it was a different one, um, but I ended up in another like, very rural setting, um, just kind of doing whatever was needed. I wasn't a teacher, I was, had a psych, well, I had half of my psychology degree, um, and just did everything random from like making ice cream for the kids, to teaching swimming, to helping kids read. Um, and out of that experience kind of came my desire to become a teacher, so I'm thankful for that. Um, and when I left that um, experience, I was like, I think I need to come back with my husband. <laughs> At the time, I didn't have a husband um, and wasn't in a relationship, but eventually Joel came along. And like he said, I put it out on the table very early before we started dating um, that this was one of my dreams and you need to be on board if this is going anywhere. Um, so I recommend that to anyone who has a dream, maybe, I don't know if anyone's single in this room, but <laughs> um, don't compromise <laughs> um, if God's placed something in your heart. Um, definitely find the person who is willing to, <laughs> 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 but only one of them came. <laughs> um, yeah, and that, we joke about it, but it was important to me, and that was um, something I was going to put out there, and um, I don't regret that. <laughs> Um, we got married in 2005, and it was only a few months later that we felt like, okay, maybe it's time to start exploring this um, Africa thing again. Um, so Joel was working for the Meeting House at the time, and we approached, was it you, Tim? <laughs> um, and said, we're going to Africa. Um, how can this work? And we actually spent our very first Christmas as a married couple on an airplane traveling. Um, I was a teacher, so I had two weeks off, and we did a whirlwind tour of Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi, meeting with different ministries and finding out if there was a place for us. Um, so the following year, we ended up moving to Zimbabwe, so we spent a year there. And <clears throat> our goal, our main goal, was to help um, the Meeting House find a partnership for, um, especially with the HIV AIDS pandemic, which was kind of front and center at the time. So um, we worked in an AIDS program at a hospital, but on the side we were kind of um, researching organizations and ended up partner partnering with um, MCC and World Vision. And I think those partnerships are still going, which is awesome. Um, so then the next step was coming back and saying, I want to bring my kids back someday. <laughs> um, and so we ended up starting a family in 2010. We have twin boys who are now eight. Um, and then shortly after, I think they were a few years old, this 
I learned about um, Mix. We learned about the school. And some of you know Jamie and Aria San Filippo. They had um, worked at they had worked in Matcha, and their girls had gone to Mix. And they started dreaming of going back one day, and we started dreaming of going back one day. Um, but it just wasn't the timing wasn't working out. Um, we also wanted to expand our family, um, and that also wasn't working out. <laughs> um, so I just remember this moment where God's saying, like, you can close that door, it's gonna be okay, um, and pursue this, this Africa thing again. And um, we ended up finding an organization, which is the BIC Canada, um, to um, kind of be our backing, and we decided to move our family to Matcha. And everything was working out great. Um, and then a few, let's say less, less than a few months before we left, um, we kind of got the surprise of our life that we were expecting our third child. <laughs> Um, we had closed the door on that, but um, it's like God was saying, you can actually have both. <laughs> you don't need to decide. So um, we had just rented out our house. Joel had just quit his job, and we were pregnant, moving to Africa. Pro tip for a husband. <laughs> so that night, the night we found out, I'm thinking, well, how can I, you know, reassure Julianne? Because this is a lot of a the lot. process. So I was like, well, you know, this really is a good thing because we've already... Like, I've already quit my job, and we've already rented our house. So now we don't have to worry about deciding with this new news, are we still going to go to Zambia? Like, we're just going. This is a great thing. And she grabs my arm, and she says, we don't have a house. You don't have a job. And I was like, OK, maybe it didn't come out the way I wanted. The goal is to make you feel better, not worse. But yeah. it all worked out. Yeah. So we still went. And January 2015 is when we moved. And then we actually came back and had Nathaniel um, in July, and then when he was seven weeks, we went back again. So um, it's just been amazing to see how God's opened the doors um, and kind of planted these new desires in our hearts along the way, um, new steps in our family, and how it's all kind of come together. And it's not always been pretty, it hasn't been the perfect picture, but um, yeah, I just really believe that when God puts something in your heart, He'll make it happen, and to not compromise on that. And yeah, we joke about just how Joel came along for the ride, but um, he was, kind of, when, Jay, uh, when we moved there, he was kind of the one who didn't know what he was gonna do. Um, he didn't have a clear role, um, unlike the other three of us, and I believe that God needed us to get him there so that he could take on this new position. Um, he's just been an awesome director, and like he said, it's not his, you know, was never his dream to be <laughs> the director of a primary school. Um, but he's a fantastic one, and um, I think he's exactly what the school needed at the time. So um, I'm thankful that he said yes to the journey and has come along the way, and I think God's using him in awesome ways. So I'm thankful for that. She's saying that because I'm her boss, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's a little bit of our, of our journey, and I think the, the thing I would want to add to it, going back to... Um, the idea that I think there are a lot of people who have this kind of thing simmering in the background or they've always wanted to try it or it's maybe not a great time because of, of this or that, is that I would encourage if you, if that's you, to, to maybe start to take some steps just to feel it out. Um, and there, there are a lot of steps between quitting your job, selling your house and moving to Africa. Uh, and keeping things the way they are. I think, you know, we've had, while we've been there, a number of either people or families come and just stay with us for a short time. And I think what they would say is, we're interested in this. Would we move to Africa one day? Maybe, we don't know. But for now, we can at least take some family vacation time and do this uh, and, and check it out. Uh, we've had other people following with us in different ways. So I would encourage you, if that is kind of there in the back of your head or in your heart, um, to you know, just see what steps you might be able to take to, to learn more. Um, because I think people tend to put it in a category of it's so out there and impossible that it's something that other people do. Um, and the truth is, you know, we're just kind of a regular couple with three kids, we were living in Mississauga, and now we live in Zambia, and it doesn't really feel that crazy, actually, once you're there. You know, we're in Canada for the summer, but I think all of us will feel at the end of this time in Canada, it's going to be good to get home. Um, we have a house there that just feels comfortable, our kids have a great routine, 
our life is really good there. Uh, and um, I think, you know, living in Africa can seem like, a, or, or other parts of the world too, can seem like this totally different foreign thing that you don't know what to expect. And the truth is, it can be a leap, but it really settles down fairly quickly into just this is life. Uh, and so I think it's accessible to most of us um, if it's something that you're interested in. I don't think everybody needs to move to Africa. That wouldn't be that helpful. But um, I think some people have that in them and it's worth, worth pursuing. Um, we'll just see a couple more things we can do, but why don't we just see if anybody has questions. If, you, if you've got questions, we would be happy to take a stab at answering them. Yes. You were saying that the children from Macha, some of them couldn't afford it, so you were able to have sponsors, and they do really well in the grade seven. How? What are their chances of going further with their financial situation? Yeah, great question. So um, it's one of the things as a school that we have been trying to figure out, uh, and so we're taking some early steps. Uh, so last year we did our first scholarship for one of our sponsored students and gave them a full, you know, full ride through secondary school at a boarding school. Uh, and so that isn't something that we are involved with other than paying the fees and giving them the supplies they need. Um, but we'll be giving out one again this year. And as we sort of see success with that, I think it's something that we could expand. Um, because it's something that supporters are really interested in. Because, I mean, what's behind your question, and you're bang on, is it's great to get kids to the point where they do well on the exam and can go to a good secondary school, but if they can't afford to go, that could be the end of the line, not because of grades, but because of finances. So yeah, we are trying to, um, trying to figure that out. I, there is a long-term idea that Mix might start a secondary school. Uh, and when I say there's a long-term idea, I mean people ask about that a lot. And we say, we don't know how long we're going to be here, and we're not ready to start something that big. But I think the right person at the right time, there is a place for that. And you could then take kids all the way through. Um, that would obviously be a major project. So today, we're, we're focused just on the scholarships to get them to the next level. Yeah, great question. Anyone else? What does your own church community look like there? Is there like a crew there on the grounds or what's that like for you guys as a family? Yeah, so there are a number of BIC churches close to where we are. There are a few different ones that, that we could attend and that we do sometimes. A lot of what we have found for our spiritual community has been uh, at mix. So uh, we've got daily chapel, daily prayer with the staff. We've done some stuff in our home. We did an alpha course with both some staff from Mix and also just members of the community, which was amazing. Uh, and so it's, it's definitely tricky for us, I think, to feel like we're plugged into a church community there. Church is just different there than what we're used to. And so there's an element of, okay, I'm going to go to be a part of things and be supportive, but there's also an element of what can we find that's going to feed us. Um, and I think, like, I think we would probably both say something like the Alpha Course, where we had people over once a week, fed them a meal, had discussion, watched the videos, felt closer to church for us than church services. Church services there are, have been hard for us just with a young family. It's incredibly hot, and the service is three hours long and there isn't really a thing for the kids. Like it's so, it's not the most natural. Like we come here and sit in church and we're like, done already. Like we should only be on the seventh choir by now. <laughs> so uh, it's quite different, but yeah. Sorry. Yeah, uh, we forgive you, Leslie, for asking questions. Um, last time you were here, you were talking about uh, encouraging more teachers that they could go to the government school to pay their wages, but you were trying to encourage them. Have you been able to up their wages or help that situation? Yeah, so that's a, that's a fantastic question. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes, and we have a video. So I'll hold the thought, um, but the short answer is yes, we're working on it. Yeah. Yes? 
You said that BIC and World Vision support you or, or have backed you? No, sorry. Um, BIC is our sending agency. So we're, we work for them, and that's where our, our support for our family goes through. When Julianne mentioned World Vision, it was back when we were working at the Meeting House and we were setting up uh, partnerships with the church. So meaning the Meeting House now has partnership with World Vision. Uh, and part of that was born back in those days when we were just there in Zimbabwe saying, what can the church do? So yeah, we're not supported by World Vision. As far as I know, nobody has like a picture of me on their fridge and a magnet with it. <laughs> as far as I know. Yeah. You're welcome to. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll have more time to chat after. A couple more things we want to do. I'm throwing this in as a bonus today. This is free of charge. But as we were uh, getting ready for today, I thought what might be fun and helpful is to share uh, a list of what I would call things not to say when you visit Africa. Because one of the things that happens for us, which um, is interesting, is we have a little community of expats in Matcha that we're good friends with. And there are regularly visitors coming through, groups of college kids, families visiting, short-term mission teams, all that kind of stuff. And the interesting thing for us is they all say the same things. And then we kind of, those of us who live there long term, look at each other and smile. We're like, yes, this is what people like to say on their first visit to Africa. And I want to say, I want to be, I'm not trying to be um, cynical here, because uh, when we look at this list, if you have said these things, don't feel bad. I guarantee you, I have said everything on this list. Part of this is just what is the process of learning about another culture like, and what are the early stages of that? But I think there may also be some things that might be helpful in terms of mindset of how we think about a place like Zambia, other countries in Africa, or whatever. Now, what I did before we came here was I just sent a note to some of our, some of our friends in Matcha and said, give me your list of stuff you've heard that was awesome. And so I'm going to start with a few of these. So our, our friends Corey and Eric sent us these. These are things they, that people have actually said to them visiting in Zambia. Um, I am so excited to see a tiger on my safari. There are not tigers there. Uh, I can't wait to see a kangaroo. That person really needs a geography lesson. Do they celebrate Christmas at the same time of year here? Answer, yes, they do. Uh, I want to take this baby home um, with, you know, that baby actually has two parents and a happy family, so <laughs> no, you can't, you can't just take that baby home. Um, can I give away my puzzles that have missing pieces or underwear with holes in it or notebooks that are mostly filled? Is there someone here who can use that? Uh, one of the things we find is people just seem to have this mindset that like stuff that literally should go in the garbage would be really appreciated in Africa, which mostly it's not. It's like we throw it in the garbage too. Uh, we're really happy to get money and new useful things. But um, so there's a, there's a few of them. And, and then, of course, I've heard this a bunch of times, and this is wonderful. Africa is a beautiful country, um, which it is. Not a country. For those of you who are like, why is that a bad thing to say? Africa is a massive continent with all kinds of different countries and cultures. So those are a few of the things. But I'm going to give you, those are kind of funny ones. I'm going to give you a few of the more common, serious ones with a couple comments. So here we go. Number one, they're so happy. I don't think I've ever had someone visit us in Zambia without saying they're so happy. And I've said it too. And what you realize when you live there is most of the people in Zambia are pretty regular people. Sometimes they're really happy, sometimes they're really sad, sometimes they're angry, sometimes they're really kind, sometimes they're jerks. Uh, they're probably happy because you're there. It's exciting to have a team visiting, and they've probably brought you some stuff, and you're trying to be a good host. And so yeah, when, when you're there for a morning getting a tour of the school, they're going to be really happy. But they're not always happy, right? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. That's just uh, life as a human. Next, these go together. They have nothing. That's actually usually in the same sentence. You know what I'm really taking away is they have nothing, but they're so happy. Well, they don't have nothing, okay? Um, 
And the other thing that I find that's really interesting, and I can look back and, and watch my own progression on this too, uh, and this is just a good thing to know. If you visit anywhere in the developing world, what you should know going in is that you don't yet know enough to recognize poverty, okay? Um, there is poverty in Zambia, un, no question, but you also could probably walk into the home of one of the top dog wealthiest people in Macha and say, how does he live like this, right? Because it's different than a house in Oakville. But actually it's like, no, this guy and his family are doing really well. This is what a nice home looks like. And that's okay. It's just a good thing to have in mind that it's tough at the beginning to recognize what poverty looks like. There is a bunch of, there are a bunch of people in Macha living in serious poverty, don't have enough to eat, and they're living, you know, paycheck to paycheck if there's a paycheck in the household, or harvest to harvest if there's not. Um, but so one of the things that is a fascinating dynamic, and I see it over and over again, is that visitors think they are on a tour to see how awful and dirty and broken down the hospital is. And the person giving the tour is proudly showing you one of the best hospitals in the area, right? Um, and I mean, we had this a, a few months ago at our school. I guarantee if you came to mix and came into our boarding area where the boys and girls sleep, you would not be blown away by the extravagance. It's really simple. Uh, and I don't know what your reaction to it would be, but it's certainly nothing to write home about. It's, not, it's, it's clean, it's safe, but it's not amazing. We had a guy come and visit who had grown up in matcha, and he walked in and he was like, wow, this is amazing. He says, when I was in high school, I shared the top bunk of a bunk bed with two other guys. And our windows were all broken. And you're, like, your windows have glass in them. You've got one kid in a bed. Like, nice place you got here. This is amazing. So our perspectives are so different, which is, which is interesting. Uh, number three, why don't they just, and then fill in the blank. It's very easy on day one or week one to come and visit uh, Zambia and then say, I can, I can see the problem here and I know how to solve it. This is really straightforward. I don't know why these idiots don't see it. And the truth is that you probably don't have all the context you need. Not probably. You don't have all the context you need. And so some of the things that we in the West perceive as problems aren't even perceived as problems there. I perceive it as a problem that the Ministry of Education routinely calls me in the evening before I'm supposed to go to a conference in some other city but no one else perceives it as a problem. All the other school heads are like, yeah, got it, I'll be there. And I'm like, why don't they give me some notice? This is me as a Westerner coming in and just projecting my culture. So why don't they just tell me in advance? Because they don't need to and no one on the receiving end needs to and it doesn't, it's just not a big deal to them. It's a different way of doing life. Uh, number four, I know how to help. Um, this is very close to the right thing to say, which is how can I help? But I know how to help, um, which we often get, is it's very, it's very common for us to sit and have um, visitors who want to do something. They've got resources, time, money, and they have an idea of what they want to do. And we're like, man, I wish they were excited about the thing we actually need at the school. That would be amazing, right? But often, people don't ask. Uh, and so that can be a challenge. And then last, uh, this seems awful when you put it on the screen, but it's true, we think it and people say it. I guess they're just used to it. Uh, people don't normally say that about the most extreme, you know, I, I guess they're just used to child starvation. People don't really say that kind of stuff. Um, but they say it about just a way of life that in a lot of ways is harder. Uh, and the, the moment for me where this crystallized was back when we lived in Zimbabwe. When we were taking a trip, a pretty long trip in a pickup truck, uh, and as is common in Africa, we had a bunch of people piled in the back of the pickup truck. Uh, it, you'd be amazed how many people can fit in the back of a pickup truck in Africa. And I made a comment to one of our good friends, Obert. I said, um, Julianne's parents are coming to visit us next, next month, and we're gonna have to use a van or something. I said, we can't ride them in the back of a pickup truck because they're not gonna be comfortable. And he looked at me and he said, well, Joel, we're not comfortable either. 
we just do what we have to do. And it reveals, like, man, I feel like a jerk, right? It reveals for me this idea that all Africans are just used to sitting in the back of pickup trucks and therefore their butt doesn't go numb the way mine does. Like, no, it does. They just don't have a choice, right? And so for us to say, well, I've got my life that I'm used to and they've got their life that they're used to can't become a reason to not work on things like proper education, clean drinking water, access to medicine, all that kind of stuff. Because those aren't things you get used to or should get used to, right? So those are just a few thoughts. And again, I think we've both said all of them, but they maybe will just help shift our perspective a little bit. All right, to wrap up, a couple thoughts and then we'll show you this video um, as how can you help? Because I know now you're all asking, Joel, how can I help? Um, a couple things quickly. One is we need a new director at the school. Long-term plan is that we would recruit a Zambian director, but for a bunch of reasons, uh, that's going to be a challenge to do right away. And so I think likely the next director of the school will also come from overseas. We are planning now to come home early next year. And so we're looking for somebody who would be willing to come and run the school, ideally with some kind of education background or training. If you think you might know someone who might know someone who might be interested, we'd love to make that connection and we can get them the info. Two, uh, we do have young adult internships. So three times a year, corresponding to our school terms at Mix, um, and the way the calendar works there is we have three months of school and then one month off. So it's like January, February, March is term one, then April off, May, June, July is term two, and then September, October, November roughly is term three. Uh, each of those terms, we've got space for young adults to come and do a three-month internship. Um, the young adults that come have a, a fantastic time. Uh, most of the job is hanging out with the boarding kids, building relationships, doing homework, playing sports, playing games, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then during the day when the school is running, we just find things that kind of fit the interests and abilities of whoever is there. Some people have taught music, some people have done science experiments, some people read stories to young kids, some people organize the storeroom closets. So it's whatever kind of is the right fit. So if you know someone who might be up for uh, you know, a three month internship uh, at Mix, we'd love to get them the information about that. Uh, and the people who come, uh, I, think, I think they have a great time, they learn a lot, they certainly help us out. Um, the next thing is going back to Leslie's question. Our teachers, when we got there, were severely underpaid. Uh, they were earning about, say, $150 a month Canadian. Uh, and you ask maybe, so what does $150 a month buy in matcha compared to here? It's like kind of the same. Maybe the housing is cheaper, but the food isn't really cheaper. So there, it's not a lot of money to live on. At a government school, they were earning three or four times that. So our teachers, not just compared to the West, but compared to Zambian government teachers, were severely underpaid. And so we have just launched a project um, through BIC Canada to raise some funds to start to make up that gap. Uh, and we're not quite going to get to the level of the government teachers, but major, major increases for our teachers, which is going to help them stay at mix. It's going to help them just be able to support their families better and uh, feel like they're earning a decent living. Um, and so uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, um, there's an email sign up out there. If you put your email on that list today, we'll make sure we get you the information um, about how you can support that. Um, there's one more thing that we'll talk about. That we've got some stuff out there that I'll let Julianne talk about, and then I'll just introduce this video for you. Um, so the last thing is just outside, we have some baskets that um, have been made by local people and also um, sets of cloth napkins. So a chitangi is something that the women wrap around themselves, kind of like a outside to their skirt or they carry their babies in them. Um, so I bought a bunch of them and had my friend who's a, one of the cleaners at the school, she sewed them just into squares to make sets of cloth napkins. So they're nice, pretty, vibrant colors. Um, we have a few left, so they're out on the table as well. Um, so if you're interested in any of that stuff, it makes great gifts. Um, that money I'll just be using um, to buy, we have an Amazon wish list and I will use it to buy some things to bring back for the school. So. 
We regularly have people at our door selling especially baskets that they've made. And once in a while, when we're just about to go home on a trip to Canada, somebody just hits the jackpot. It's like, <laughs> how many baskets can you make in two weeks and show up at the door and we will buy them from you. So, um, all right, we're gonna watch this video in a second. I'll just give you a little bit of context. We, we would have loved to bring some mixed teachers here so that you could meet them, um, but it wasn't completely practical. So next best thing is just to give you a little bit of an introduction to them in a video. So what you'll see is just a quick, quick profile of two of our teachers. Uh, one of the teachers you'll see, Mr. Mianda, is actually the grade three teacher, so he teaches our boys, Caleb and Micah. Uh, and this is a guy who, He's a phenomenal, phenomenal teacher. I mean, uh, both the teachers you'll see here are, um, and, but this guy is just uh, a force of nature. So um, every day, if you walk past the grade three class at Mix at the right time, as they start the day, you will hear Mr. Mianda say, class, are we ready? And 25 grade threes shout back, we were born ready, and that's how they start their day. So he's just an awesome, energetic guy. You can ask Caleb and Micah about him. You'll meet him. You'll also meet Mrs. Muziamba, who's our grade seven teacher, and also just phenomenal. They'll give a little bit of just a profile of what they do, and then after that, we'll, um, we'll close. My name is Joe Mianda. I'm a grade three teacher at Mix. I've been teaching at Mix for uh, two years. I always um, try hard to bring new things to my pupils. I always try hard to motivate my pupils. Give Jesus higher. Give Jesus higher. I always try hard to see my pupils smiling. Now, the way I started planning, how am I going to enter in the class? How am I, how, how am I going to open the door so that uh, I, 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 I greet my pupils or so that the pupils can see the teacher in me? So the first thing, I plan. So if I plan, I take different things to my yes. pupils. Why the best thing Because we are multiplied by what? By nine, by one. Are we together? Fifteen. Yes. Fifteen divided by two. Now we don't divide like we normally do. This is a special topic where we don't divide it the normal way. My what name is Mrs. That? Muziamba. I'm a grade seven teacher at Mix. As teachers, we are always an example to the students, and the students always look at what we are doing in every angle, socially, academically, maybe even um, professionally. They always look at us, even outside school, they want to imitate what we do. So a teacher is a role model to the student. I have to be a good example by the way I associate with fellow teachers, people in the community, even at home, because you never know when a student is watching. So you have to be alert and just be yourself as a teacher. As I look at my students, I'm telling you, I'm seeing doctors in my class. I can see even the prime ministers, uh, the presidency, and I can see uh, the teachers. Um, it's a great day, uh, a class I have. His students are very sharp, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, these students, uh, at some point, uh, they are going to come back uh, and also help me. It is even awesome to be part of Mix because you feel a family belonging. You are in one family. There's love, there's unity. Even when preparing lessons, you help one another. Even in the lesson that you have a bit challenges, you know, being a teacher, it's not that you know everything. Sometimes you tend to have challenges, but here at Mix, we always help one another. When you have a challenge, you go to another teacher to say, how do you do this? And the teacher will help. Of course, we see uh, people shifting from uh, our school mix. They go to government schools due to number of uh, reasons they do consider. But the first thing,
they consider is money, the salary. But when you go to government schools, you have to stand on your own. Resources are limited. Sometimes even the books, they're not even available. So you have to at least go to the neighboring schools and, and beg for some books. I think as teachers, it would really help if the salary would go to the level of the government so that we don't have challenges where teachers run to the government. They would stay here as permanent teachers who would not even think of going to the government because they have the same salary with the government teachers. Thank you, Ms. Aria. For us in Zambia, payday is a jackpot because there's a lot of responsibility awaiting the pay. For example, there are responsibilities like paying rent for the houses. Most of us, we don't have personal houses, so we rent those houses. And even paying for school fees for students, maybe nephews or nieces, regardless of having children, you have also to extend to nephews and nieces. As a Zambian culture, you know, we have got um, uh, different people around us. Your grandmother, you are keeping your grandmother, your uncle. We have got a responsibility to help those people. As you get your money, you think about your relatives first. You think about your parents. You think about your neighbor. This way you look at is Militia. Can we read it together? Militia. Again. It's better to be a teacher by calling, not just because you don't have anything to do, because teaching professional involves students and you need to be prepared for them. You need to have a heart because we have different students in a class who behave differently. So if you are not called for that, it will be a bit of a challenge. You will become harsh or rude to them because it's not your calling. So I would advise if you want to be a teacher, check yourself, think about it. Am I ready to face this whole challenge or this whole band of students? Am I going to face them? Am I going to help them where they need help? When they come here, when they go somewhere, our fruit, it will be germinating. And everyone is going to harvest what we are planting here, what we are sowing here. So that is, is sometimes I motivate them, I encourage them to say, ah, I know you're going to help the, 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 the whole world. Not just a country, not just a community, the whole world. You are going to be somebody um, uh, great in, in life. So there, I think you can see, those are incredible teachers. Any of us would be happy to have our kids in a class with them. They're pouring themselves into their work and into their students, and they're doing it for 150 bucks a month. Uh, and so we would love to do what we can to help get their wage up just to a kind of a fair level within Zambia. Um, if you are interested in just learning more about that, again, just sign the, put your email on the sheet out there and then we'll make sure that we um, can stay in touch and, and get you the information. I want to say thanks to you guys just for the chance to share. Uh, it's, it means a lot for us when we're here in Canada just to be able to kind of update people uh, and we'll be out there after. If you want to come and chat, we'd love to, to chat more with you. So I'll hand it back to Matt. Yeah, will you guys just stand with me? Let's pray for Joel and Julianne and their family and the school and uh, just the chance we've had to just to listen and to learn together. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these friends and uh, even just to hear the background and the story of their journey of stepping forward. Um, Julian had the sense from a long time, God, that you're calling her into something like this. And just to hear how her exploration, the different directions it took her and then for her and Joel, as a couple and then as a family with the boys. God, just thank you for the example of a willingness to say yes and to take steps and to move forward. And if there's friends here in this room that are considering or sensing that you are nudging them in a direction, God, give us courage 
and the willingness to follow uh, your call and, and the invitation you give us to explore and to try new things, that you give us the chance to say yes and to check things out. God, I just want to pray for their family. Thank you for the, the gift they are to us that we can learn and listen today. And as they have the rest of the summer, give them great times with family and friends. Uh, encourage them, give them some rest and downtime. And as they head back, continue to encourage and use them in their roles. Uh, we pray for provision financially for the school, for the teachers, for the students who are progressing. Um, God, maybe there's some folks here who need to step into those places and help meet some of those gaps. Uh, give us courage to step into those places. Also, we pray for the provision of a director, a long-term director for the school, whether that be an international leader uh, and eventually someone, uh, a Zambian woman or man, to step into that role. God, we just continue to provide in those ways. and. Um, Keep shaping us as a church what it means to pay attention not only what you're calling us to here locally, but also to global opportunity and ways we can learn and partner together. At the end of the day, we're just women and men who are trying to say yes, Jesus, to you and your call and invitation and be faithful with the opportunities you give us. So thanks for Joel and Julianne and their boys and the chance we have this morning to spend time with them. Amen.